Hey everybody, Coach Hughes here from the Be Best You podcast. I got to say it, right? In order to lead others, um, you got to be the best version of yourself because no one's going to follow a mess. Uh, I, I need a little ba dump bump at the end of that, but uh, it's, a, it's, it's true, right? You know, who's going to follow somebody who doesn't, uh, doesn't know what they're doing? And there's too many people out there in a position of uh, influence and coaching that shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be leading other people, right? <laughs> But uh, I'm really excited to have um, on the podcast this, this time is a gentleman by the name Mike uh, Robbins. And I found Mike by, uh, I found a book um, through my research called We Are All In This Together. And this is just one of a few books that he's written and I'll allow him to kind of share uh, some of the books that he's written. And interestingly enough, uh, the Be Best You idea is in order to lead others and, and, and build a team, you have to be the best version of yourself. And ironically, uh, I'm not sure uh, how many years ago you wrote it, uh, but you wrote a book about becoming the, the best version of yourself and you share a little bit about your personal journey and, and how you've gotten to this point. So, so I think you have some uh, legit credentials in, in that area as well as other areas. Um, but uh, welcome, Mike, to, uh, and thank you for, for taking the time. I know you have a podcast yourself that I'll share with everybody, and, um, but uh, welcome. Thank you for coming on. Well, thanks, John, for having me or coach. Um, I, I appreciate being here and appreciate your interest in my books and my work and glad to get a chance to chat with you and everyone who's listening to us. Yep. Yeah. And to let you know, I share with you a little bit about the the main audience, but then there's the other audience that's outside the the main group that I work with. Um, people will also see it that way. And, and any team or any organization, you know, how do you build a team? How do you uh, create that culture, you know, what are the core values, all those kinds of things you speak about and you provide a really uh, simple, easy to follow roadmap, if you will, to begin the, uh, you know, creating that team that you want to, that you want to succeed with. Yeah. Uh, but a little about you, I, I know your history was, uh, you know, one, I, I love your story. You, you tell in the book, you tell a lot of stories. You talk about growing up um, as a basketball player in a, in a black community mm -hmm. and just different perspective. Uh, yeah. you, uh, how you had to work. You, you went to uh, Stanford and played baseball, played yep. a lot of sports yep. uh, injuries. So if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about, you know, your journey to this point and what, why you got into this uh, particular, uh, you know, work line of sure. work. Well, I mean, I'm sure it resonates with you as a, you know, former athlete and coach yourself and obviously your dad being um, such a prolific athlete and coach himself. So yeah, I grew up, I live here in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, where I grew up. I grew up in Oakland, played baseball all growing up as a kid, did play some basketball as well, although I wasn't nearly as good at basketball. Um, but a couple things that were interesting about growing up is I grew up in Oakland and as I write about a bit and we're all in this together, um, you know, by the time I got to high school, especially uh, you know, went to public schools, predominantly African American, Asian American kids at the school. So as a white kid, I was actually in the minority, which I know is strange, because that's not the case, sort of writ large in the culture. But it, it taught me a number of things about life, about sports, about just connecting with and interacting with a lot of people who were different than me. And I didn't fully understand and appreciate it at the time. But then when I, I did get a chance to play baseball in college at Stanford, I actually got drafted by the New York Yankees out of high school, but I didn't sign because I wanted to go play baseball in college and had the opportunity, the, the good fortune of getting an opportunity to play at such a great university academically, but also a really great baseball program at Stanford and ended up getting drafted out of Stanford by the Kansas City Royals. And at that point, I did sign a pro contract and, you know, the way it works in pro baseball is I'm sure many of the folks listening know um, you get drafted by a major league team, whether it's the Yankees or the Royals or the Giants or the Dodgers or any of the teams in the major leagues, you got to go in the minor league. So I go into the minor leagues. I was a left-handed pitcher trying to work my way up to the big leagues. And unfortunately my third season still in the minors, I went out to pitch one night. Actually, I was not too far from where you are. I was pitching for the Wilmington Blue Rocks in Wilmington, okay. Delaware, um, not that far from New Jersey. Yeah, and we were actually, we were actually, it was 1997. I was pitching against the Durham Bulls. So I know I'm dating myself a bit, but anybody who watched the movie Bull Durham that came out in the late eighties that I love yeah. with Kevin Costner and Susan Sarandon. Um, but I, I threw one pitch that night against the Durham Bulls and tore ligaments in my elbow, basically blew my arm out. I was 23 at the time when I got hurt. I had started playing baseball when I was seven, mm. two years, three surgeries later, I was finally forced to retire from baseball 
and didn't know what the heck I wanted to do with my life because, you know, that had really been the focus of my life. John, I mean, you know, I'd gone to school, I'd, I had other interests, but the primary thing that I did was play baseball. And it was more than just what I did. It was my identity. So it was super challenging and painful to go through that experience as anybody, whether it's in sports or anything else, when you have something happen that all of a sudden life takes a left turn and you not much you can do about it. Um, you know, and a lot of us experience these type of things, whether it's a job loss or the loss of someone we love or the end of a relationship or an injury or an illness, or, I mean, there are things that, right. Sure. I mean, I know this now with more life experience and perspective, but at the time I was really stuck and really in kind of a bad way, but two things happened for me at that time. I mean, this was, you know, I'm 48 years old now. This was back when I was in my mid twenties. Um, I knew at some level, I mean, it's in relation to your podcast and the show, like there was a part of it that I was going to have to figure out internally, how am I going to navigate through this very painful, difficult experience? And then there was this other piece that didn't really click for me until I left baseball and got my first sort of real job working in the late nineties for an internet company out here in the San Francisco, Silicon Valley area where I live. I had become fascinated, John, by team dynamics, mm -hmm. group dynamics, because I had been on a lot of teams over the years playing baseball where, and even basketball and other sports when I was younger, where we had really good talent, really good players, but the team wasn't very good. Yeah. Just super frustrating, right? Because you figure, right, if you have the best players, you should have the best team. That's not always the case because I was on some other teams where, you know, the talent was decent, not great, but the team was fantastic. And we like would beat other teams with better players than we had, which was cool, but didn't totally make sense. You know, we called it chemistry, but no one knew what the heck that was or how to define it. But you knew when you had it and you definitely knew when you didn't have it. And it wasn't just some warm, fuzzy, touchy feely thing. It like made us play better. Yeah. And when I got my very first job, you know, working for a tech company, internet company selling advertising, like I don't even know what I'm doing, but I'm, I, I immediately realized, oh, that whole team chemistry thing that I erroneously thought was a sports thing. That's not a sports thing. That's a human thing. Mm -hmm. In business, we just call it culture. And whether it's a, you know, in any group, any team, I mean, we're a family, a sports team, a business team, you know, an entire company, that culture exists and it's like well what goes into creating that culture and that really after a couple years working for a few tech companies in the 90s i decided i want to dedicate my life to continuing to you know learn my own journey and process and work through things and figure out how i can be the best version of myself mm -hmm. and hopefully share some of that with others but also learn about what does it take for great teams to really be great and try to then share some of that wisdom with other people. And my most recent book, we're all in this together that yep. you read really is a culmination of the last 20 plus years of my research and my experience in working with teams and leaders on here are some of the components that really make teams thrive. And, you know, the last thing I'll say on this and then we can shift gears to continue to talk about other things is I wrote this book at the end of 2019, knowing it would come out in the spring of 2020, but having no idea that the entire world was going to turn upside down as it did with the pandemic. And the interesting thing, John, is the phrase we're all in this together is something that a lot of people were using, especially in the early days of COVID and continue to use. And so it's been an interesting journey just over the last couple of years, working with a lot of teams and a lot of the clients that we work with, just as life and business and everything has been so disrupted and turned around that in some ways, a lot of the things that I write about and speak about are both more challenging than ever these days, but they're also, I think, more important than ever. Yeah. yeah. And you know what, you tell a lot of good stories. And I thought about, about adversity and uh, I can't help but talk about, uh, you know, tonight's the third episode of The Captain mm -hmm. uh, on ESPN. I, I watched uh, the first two episodes twice already um so you're a big jeter I, fan yeah yeah i'm a yankee <laughs> jeter fan you know but uh but you know i just i mean obviously everything he did and there's a lot of personal actually my dad passed and mm. the night before he passes when jeter hit his last uh game winning run oh, so I remember one, of my that. Fond, one of my fondest memories and we actually had derek uh, speak at one of our meetings just this year 
Oh, did you? I was you? able to thank him as uh, that's one of the last memories I have of my father. That's uh, beautiful. Big Yankee fan. He, he appreciated that. But, you know, I, I think about your story and the struggles and how that taught you and go back to your high school days um, and how that taught you to fight and battle and where you found sports and that helped you overcome adversity. You know, here you are, your elbow's gone. You know, what do I do? And that's a life changing uh, episode. Yeah. But, but then you look at a Derek Jeter and, you know, his, the strength of his family and yeah. how that kept him not protected, but it gave him the ability to fight adversity. So what I was thinking, um, as you were saying this was knowing a little bit of your story, seeing a little bit about Derek Jeter's and, you know, how adversity can, can really shape you and how some people will respond to it and it'll crush them and other people will thrive. And then the last part, if you will, and kind of talk about this, when you talk about team and, uh, and, uh, family, yeah. uh, you know, they're supposed to be the same, but our first team, which I loved when you read it, I was like, yeah, you know, nurture nature, our first team is our family for sure. And our first influence. So can, can you yeah. speak to that a little bit and how important that is for people to recognize as they're trying to create a team that the family, their family dynamics, their first team influence really has something to say about how they're going to lead a team. Totally. Well, a couple things. First of all, I'm a huge Derek Jeter fan myself, even though I grew up in Oakland, big Oakland A's fan. I was actually at the game the night he did that crazy flip at the Oakland Coliseum oh. on that play at the plate. Oh, wow. Which I still think, by the way, Jeremy Giambi was safe, but they called him out <laughs> because he should have slid and the play was so ridiculous. But and Derek and I are also exactly the same age. So we okay. both graduated high school in 1992. In fact, Derek was the first pick by the Yankees, the number six pick overall in the 92 draft. The Yankees yeah. drafted me in that same draft much later. Yeah. I didn't sign with them because I went to Stanford, but um, I've never actually met Derek or played against him. But because we are contemporaries and of course, I'm a huge yeah. baseball fan. Um, I've always, I've always appreciated and admired him because he's not the biggest, he's not the strongest, he's not the most talented, the kid and, and anyone who's watching the documentary knows this, like grows up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is yeah. kind of a weird place for any baseball player to come from just given the weather and the whole thing, but he's biracial growing up in the community where he grew up in the Midwest in Michigan and dealt with. And I'm learning a lot in watching the documentary, a lot of challenges just based on his racial identity and otherwise. But talk about a really incredible family unit. Mm -hmm. And just watching it, actually, a buddy of mine was texting me and asking me some questions about it and just, if, are you watching it? What do you think? And it's just like watching that and seeing the amount of love and the amount of support that existed. And as you see his parents being interviewed and his sister, there was just like this really strong bond. And look, some of us are fortunate enough to come from really strong families mm -hmm. where both of our parents are there and we have siblings and everyone really loves each other. And there's a ton of support. Some of us like me, you know, my parents split up when I was three and my mom raised me and my older sister as a single mom. And it, you know, she loved us and we had a lot of support and it was challenging. Other people grow up in environments where there's, you know, abuse and there's alcoholism and there's all kinds of chaos going on. And I say that because it's not an excuse for us in life, but it's important because that first team that we have, our family, right. informs everything about who we are. Now, yes, we come in with certain traits, we come in with certain skills, we come in with certain challenges, you know, there's the whole nature part, but the nurture part of it is we learn a lot about how to deal with conflict. We learn a lot about how to share and collaborate. We learn a lot about how to deal with boundaries and consequences. My wife and I are raising two teenage girls right now, 16 and 13. And we're seeing every day as I try and at times fail <laughs> as a parent to like, wow, we're not just trying to have them be good kids. We're trying to teach them how to be good, productive, healthy adults. And sure. so again, I say all of that because I think if we look back at our own family history, there are a lot of things that can inform who we are and how we are right now. Again, were the, you the oldest, the youngest, the middle child? How did things go with your parents? Again, not to psychoanalyze it necessarily, but I do think so much of our early childhood experience and our experience growing up then does inform a lot of how we think about leadership and teamwork and creating teams and environments around us because, you know, that's the model that we have 
And so it's important in some cases, again, if you had a deficit as many of, even if you had a great family situation, yeah. sometimes when I talk to people who had like, oh, I had this amazing dad or I had this amazing mom or my parents were, there's the issue of like, I don't know if I can live up to that. I want to be like my father or like my mother or they're so great. On the other hand, you know, it's like I grew up without my dad around at all. So there are times even now my dad passed away 20 years ago and my dad and I actually, by the time I got to my 20s, we had reconciled a lot of stuff and had created a lot of peace in our relationship. But there are moments even still now, John, where I'll look at my wife and I'll say to her, not an excuse, but I got no file on the hard drive on this one. <laughs> like I got nothing. I, I don't know what to do or what to say here because I literally never saw it. So I'm going to have to make it up. Yeah. But again, I look at that and not to minimize the challenge of it, but I look at that as an opportunity because like I get to create that. Mm. Hold on. Sorry, I was having a microphone to create that in whatever way that I want to, if you will. Sure. And so, again, I say that to people because it's easy to, you know, blame our circumstances growing up if they weren't ideal. And those things do have an impact on us. But I think it's also important to realize like we all have an opportunity to learn, to grow, to change, to transform. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not all of us may be fortunate enough to have the kind of family that Derek Jeter had. And I do think that's a part of his success. But I also think he, as we're learning in this documentary, and all of us, most of us aren't going to be the starting shortstop for the New York Yankees when we're, you know, 21, 22 years old. But all of us have to overcome certain aspects of adversity in our lives and in our journeys. And that's just part of the deal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, so thinking about Be Best You and then the whole idea in order to lead others. So, you know, bring time all together. And again, just, just recently, we had an opportunity to hear Dabo Sweeney speak. And, oh, wow. you know, if anybody follows him, you know, his story, homeless in high school and all this stuff. And he talked about the windshield and the mirror. Yeah, and I've heard that before, but. Um, what I think about is in order to build a team, you, your first team being your family, as you speak about, which I think is great. And, and as you're trying to build your team moving forward, whatever your team is, you can't, you can't live in the past, but you are part of your past. So you can't ignore it. Right. So you want to keep that windshield in there. Just remember where you came from and, and then the, the opportunity for you to change and, and not do some of the things or do some of the things that you were raised as as you move forward you know that right. whole you know in, in disproportion but i think yeah you know a lot of people will try to create their team in the likeness of what they know right and what they know sometimes is not what you want to build a team in because that, but that's the only team that they know is their family especially younger guys yeah. right 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 and again i think look we can lean on different i mean one of the things that drew me to team sports growing up was my family was pretty small. We had some challenges. A lot of our extended family was on the East Coast or other parts of the country. And so there was a desire that I had to be a part of larger teams and groups and communities. You know, if you come from a really big family, multi-generational family, everyone gets together once a month for a big, you know, cookout or barbecue or whatever. I mean, again, and again, there's no right or wrong way, I think, but it, it does to your point, I think we tend to lean on experiences we have both from our family and other things. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but part of continuing to evolve. And this is a big part of why anyone listening to this podcast, obviously, and those, the folks that you coach, John, in the work that you do, it's like bringing that growth mindset to it. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to be the best version of myself. I want to be better than I was yesterday. I mean, all the things that we say, part of that is, yes, we take our experience from the past. Mm. We look at things that we've learned along the way that have been helpful and try to use those. We look at things that maybe we've learned or experienced along the way that haven't been so useful and let those go. But then there's always something new to learn. I mean, one of the things, and I don't mean to minimize any of the stress and challenge that we've all dealt with over the last couple of years through the pandemic, but I do appreciate, and I say that word very deliberately, I do appreciate how it has forced me and so many of us to learn and to change and to pivot and to adjust and to let go of some of our ways of thinking, ways of working, e expectations for how things are, mm -hmm. and just forces us kind of into the present moment of, you know, one of the mantras my wife and I have, and I have this with my team as well as what's the next right thing. Because sometimes with all the plans and all the goals and all the things and everything, it's like, okay, 
that just got blown up or the world just got flipped upside down for the 15th time in the last three months. Like what's the next right thing for us to focus on right now, today, in this moment? And at some level, the paradox oftentimes of leadership and teamwork is like, yes, we have to have plans and goals and visions and know where we're headed and all that stuff. And just like I learned in sports, it's like, I want to win the game. I want to make it up to the next level. I want to have all these big, but right now I just have to throw this pitch mm. and try to hit my spot and get this guy out. Cause if I don't, I'm going to be sitting on the bench and the game's going to be over and we're going to lose. And if I keep doing that, I'm going to be out of the game and out of baseball. You know what I mean? So it's like, we have to be able to hold paradoxically the goals, the visions, the intentions, where we're headed, manage people, get people motivated. But at the same time, like, what am I going to do right now? Right. In this moment, what's the next right action for me to take? And that's often what differentiates between good teams and great teams, good leaders and great leaders is the ability to hold both of those things simultaneously. And what I'm hearing you saying is interesting. So Dallas Sweeney said that he plans 13 months in advance. He has a 13 month year and he speaks about that, uh, which, you know, we were, everybody was like, what, you know, awesome. Then Derek Jeter, you know, he spoke about it after they lost, you know, when Manning was retired, right. how, you know, he didn't fest on, he was like, he was pissed, you know, yeah. language. and then every time they won a world series, you know, okay, let's win another one. Right. And, um, you know, the, the gentleman I work with, I've been working for him for almost 40 years and we were chatting last evening and our company's accomplished some pretty amazing things. And, you know, we're celebrating this and we're happy with doing it. And there's a lot of blood in the water, as he he would call it. But he said something last night that resonated and kind of speaks to what you just spoke about you with your mantra with your wife. Is um, he said when you get comfortable, you get complacent. And where we what we've accomplished as a brand as a company is pretty cool, and not many mm. people ever get to this point. Mm -hmm. But he said to me last night for the probably the umpteenth thousandth time, uh, and I look forward to it now. Where in the past I would roll my eyes. He would say, we're just beginning. Yeah. You know, we're just beginning. You know, this is just, you know, okay, great. Celebrate, but what's next? Right. And it's, I think there's an interesting tension point in that, that I think is really important for all of us to think about as human beings and as leaders. Um, Cause I think we can err on one side or the other, right? We can get really comfortable and complacent. We can get sort of caught up in our own success and think we're so great and then be humbled right? And then realize, oh, we got complacent, we got a little lazy, we got a little fat and happy or whatever cliche we want to use. On the flip side, though, I do think sometimes, and I learned this the really hard way as an athlete, I was so obsessed with, focused on and scared, quite frankly, about not making it that I was like, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get to the big leagues. I'm going to pitch in Yankee Stadium and make the money and write all the things that I wanted that there was a part of me that was kind of holding my breath, hoping that I didn't screw it up. And then when I did finally get hurt and my career ended a lot sooner than I wanted it to, I was like, oops, mm. I think I missed the point. I forgot to actually appreciate the journey. I was so focused on the outcome. And so again, we can go to the extreme, right? Where it's like, at some level, I used to say this all the time, I don't say it as often, but like my first book that I wrote, Focus on the Good Stuff, came out back in 2007. And a big part of my work was and still is about appreciation. But I would often be speaking to a group of leaders, people of different, you know, very successful people, people, you know, going through big struggles, whatever. And I would say to them right now, today, this is the good old days at some point in the future in your life. Yeah. It will be, even if it's really hard right now, even if we're just trying to get through this difficult time, which again, right now, sort of collectively what's going on in the country and the world, sure. it's hard to imagine we're going to think of this as the good old days because we're all kind of like, can we just get to the other side of this crazy time? And I get that. But at some point, we will look back like we do in life and nostalgically and go, oh, remember? Mm -hmm. And so I say that because, again, back to the thing about can I balance the like, what's the vision and what do I do today? I think, can we balance the like ambition, the pushing, the what's next, the take it to the next level thing that is a part of driving our performance and success. And at the same time, authentically be able to celebrate and appreciate what's happening right now. Because sometimes it's like one of my favorite movie lines, it's from a movie that's now quite old, but I loved it when it came out and I still love it from Goodwill Hunting. 
um, there's a scene in Goodwill Hunting where, you know, Robin Williams, who was rest, rest in peace, who was my probably my favorite actor, entertainer of anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Was the therapist, right? Talking to Matt Damon, who at the time was young and he was this, you know, brilliant but troubled young man. And Robin Williams says to Matt Damon in one of their therapy sessions, you'll have bad times. Everyone does. But it'll just wake you up to all the good stuff you weren't paying attention to. Mm. And to me, when I hear that line, it almost brings me to tears because I feel like that's part of the human condition is that like something bad happens, which yeah. we never like. But one of the silver linings when something really bad happens is it does stop us and often put things in perspective and we go, wow, yeah, you know what? There's a lot of good stuff going on that I actually was taking for granted and wasn't paying attention to. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting freaked out here because I'm thinking you just were listening in on my conversation downstairs during the <laughs> lunch break because, you know, what I talk what I talked about was, um, you know, in, in life, a couple people were asking me a question. I said, in life, I heard this right before I, I met my wife now. It's my best friend and I've been blessed to have her. And a uh, person said, you know, you need to slow down to move faster. We've all heard yeah. that before. Not slow down and move faster okay i get that and then he said in life you spend a lot of time running from something mm -hmm. or running to something and sometimes you just need to stop running yeah and be okay and and what i teach my my guys this week i say guys this week gives you an opportunity to not run you don't need to yeah. run this week this week is a time for you to stop what you're doing and we do an evaluation we do a self um uh, a personality assessment or a life assessment you know where yeah. are you financially where are you fitness and then we right. say you know okay a lot of people are happy with they are great. What are you, what's your plan to stay there and, and keep improving? But a lot of people aren't. And mm. before you mm. start chasing this new person version of yourself, you need to revisit the past and change yeah. your habits and choices and stuff. Um, but uh, I'm looking at the time and I could talk forever, but I, there's two <laughs> other things I wanted. Now you have these pillars in yes. here. Yep. Um, and there's two things that I wanted to do that really stuck out to me. Um, the first one though, which I love is, um, recognition and appreciation yeah i had i had to i read the book i read back i had to listen to it a couple more times and and um today i was bringing it up because i had mentioned that i was going to be interviewing you to the group and i was having really struggling to articulate i understand the difference yes now, but i had a hard time articulating what's the difference there's they're similar but there is right. a difference between recognition and appreciate appreciation yes. you in a team dynamics Yep. Can, you, can you share a little bit of insight on that? I thought that was. Absolutely. I mean, this has been, so I talk about in, in we're all in this together. My most recent book, I talk about this in pillar four, which is about caring about and challenging each other, which is a really important thing for teams to do. And for many years, I've been talking about this distinction between recognition and appreciation, which we use these words interchangeably, especially in our professional lives. Leaders do this a lot, even organizations and teams people running small businesses, big companies, where there's a lot of performance focused as there should be. But so if we separate these two things out, recognition is about outcome result. So we recognize a result. It could be informal, like, hey, good job, way to go. It could be more formal, like here's a bonus, here's a reward, here's an award, here's a promotion. Like the recognition comes, in, you know, when we were in school, it came in the form of grades. If you play sure. sports, if you get a trophy. I mean, look, nowadays everybody gets a trophy and then the trophy doesn't yeah. mean anything. That's a problem, it's right? A because podcast in itself. <laughs> right. But 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 when you think about it, the participation trophy is a problem because it actually devalues the recognition. So, like if you get a trophy, like here you got a gold medal or a silver medal or a bronze medal, like we know what those things mean in terms of there's a hierarchy. There were a hundred people competing in the race. Someone came in yeah. first, someone came in second, someone came in third, and then those are the three medalists. No one else got a medal. That all makes sense. Now, there is a certain intensity and brutality to that when we talk about it in sports. But in business, it's the same thing. You either hit the number or exceed the number. You, you meet the mark or you don't meet the mark. Appreciation, on the other hand, is about valuing people. It's about caring about people. Mm. So recognition is about performance. Appreciation is about people. So what that means is and the example that I often use when I talk about this or speak about it, or I've written about this a lot over the years is like, as a pitcher, my least favorite experience pitching over all those years when I get pulled out of the game, especially if I did really bad, like I gave up seven runs in the second inning, I couldn't get anybody out and they'd come yank me out. The worst part of that whole experience is when I'd go sit down on, on the bench in the dugout, nobody would talk to me. Mm. 
because that's kind of it's gotten a little better in the last 25 years in baseball but for the most part there's still kind of this weird unwritten rule like oh leave him alone he's upset and yeah i was upset but what i needed in those moments was some appreciation not recognition they're not going to go hey robin's great job because no yeah. i did a terrible job <laughs> like not only for myself but for the team we're probably going to lose so like we got to hold people accountable there's probably some coaching and feedback necessary but in the moment that i just got pulled out of the game if any one of my teammates or coaches really knew me as a human what they would have known is what I needed was someone to express some care, some concern, some actual interest and appreciation for me, the human, not just the pitcher that just got lit up and didn't pitch a good game. You see what I mean? But if it's we're all we're thinking yeah. about is recognition, we don't want to recognize mediocrity or failure. We don't. We want people to know this is great. This is good. This is mediocre. This is not good at all. And, you know, poor but we want people to feel valued and cared about all the time. So I often say to people that recognition is again, some kind of acknowledgement, either informally or formally about the performance. Appreciation sometimes can be asking questions. Appreciation can be listening to someone. Appreciation can be just expressing the care of someone, acknowledging, well, I know you're going through a hard time or like, wow, that must be a lot. Or asking someone how they're doing and genuinely listening. Sometimes it might be praise in the form of, inherent qualities in the person that aren't conditional based on performance, meaning I appreciate how hard you work. I appreciate the way you think that it's so different than the way that I think it makes me think differently. I appreciate your willingness to speak up about hard things because sometimes I'm not courageous enough to ask those questions or say those things. Those kind of things aren't necessarily about someone producing or performing something. It's just about I got your back. I see you. I value you. And so it's subtle, but it's different. And when leaders can do this and teams get this, then we recognize performance when it's deserved. Absolutely. And we really make a point of doing it emphatically. And we appreciate people all the time because oftentimes when appreciation is most needed mm -hmm. is when things aren't going well, when people are struggling, when people feel stressed out, disconnected, frustrated with the result, we come back and let them know you're valued, you're cared about, you belong here. And by the way, the result isn't what we want, but that doesn't mean you're a bad person. That just means we're not producing the result. Yeah, I have a smirk on my face because I'm also thinking I need to call my wife because because <laughs> uh, lots of times, right? I mean, we we men or me, uh, yep. and as I'm older, I've been through a broken relationship and I'm trying to be the best in this relationship. And at times my wife will be like, I don't want recognition, you know, that you did a good job. She wants the appreciation. So lots of yep. these skills spill over into as you know into all areas of of, of totally. our lives you know back to earlier part i want to connect it to something that happened when i brought up uh the running part i remember that what the um conversation was was um i was telling people lots of times we're so busy going from where we are to where we have to go we don't notice the little things that are happening you know i'm not talking mm -hmm. about rainbows and the pretty bird or or whatever but i was listening today um to the news on the way in and uh the, uh, mayor de blasio from new york city is now he's the ex-mayor he right. was going to run for another office and yesterday or day before he dropped out right saw and that the, the interviewer said to him uh, what is your um what was your biggest you know mistake what did you think you could have done bet what you did better and he said two things he said communication and connection mm. and, and like is is the the recognition and the appreciation i think that's what probably he probably recognized a lot of people in the connection yep. piece but never really and he kind of even spoke speaks to that ironically but he kind of alludes to this whole idea that he really didn't appreciate the relationships yeah. the importance yeah. of relationships yeah well and i think a lot of that also speaks to look i mean we could have a whole discussion about politicians irrespective of you know political affiliation one of the biggest challenges I think that a lot of politicians and leaders face these days is an inability, even with all of these platforms we have to communicate, an inability to connect human to human, yep. right? And, and leaders struggle with this, especially leaders in big organizations are trying to influence lots and lots of people, diverse groups of people. But one of the things that I've learned over the years of studying this, John, is that it is about appreciation. It's also about authenticity. And, you know, have you ever seen, I mean, using the politician as the example, it's like the politician runs the whole campaign, they get to the very end, they lose, right? And they're giving their concession speech. And in the concession speech, everyone says, well, if that person would have showed up, they would have won. Because in those moments, they're often 
I can only imagine how exhausting and maybe humiliating at, at minimum vulnerable it is to get up and say, thank you so much for supporting me. And I just called so-and-so and, th and congratulated them on beating me. Like that's gotta be a hard moment as a human. And what that usually brings forth is some sense of humility, some sense of vulnerability, some sense of the real person shows up. And often it's like, wow, I think if that person would have run the campaign and showed up that way, they might've done better. Because sure. again, and it's tricky though, because we live in this world and I don't mean to make this about politics. And look, I'm not involved in politics. I would never run for office, but I appreciate the fact that people are willing to do that. But I think it's so tricky because we want our politicians and leaders to be real and genuine and authentic and vulnerable. And at the same time, we live in this weird sort of gotcha media culture of things where it's like, oh, they said the wrong thing. Oh, they made a mistake. Oh, and it's like, and again, most of us aren't going to be running for office, but all of us are dealing with people's perceptions of us. Mm -hmm. And it is a tricky thing when I talk to leaders about this, because what builds trust one-on-one -on -one and what creates psychological safety, which I talk about a lot and we're all in this together, is the willingness for people and especially the leaders to actually show up authentically and even be willing to be vulnerable, although that can be risky and scary and uncomfortable. And our, you know, our parents' generations and generations, they weren't trained to do that. I mean, no. This is uh, this is all new to them. You know, this this is a, the beginning of a whole. And again, culture wasn't something you talked about. Uh, nope. You know, uh, those kinds of things. So, so um, last two things. Um, if I were to, you know, people are going to get this book here, but you also mentioned that this, your books that you've written. Um, yep. Uh, my screen keeps going there and i did order all of them by the way so well thank you here amazon i love amazon uh <laughs> yes. i bought five of these and i gave them four of them away already this one here oh but, well, thank um, you for doing that is there an order i asked john gordon this uh, i said you know you've got a lot of books yep. is there one that someone should start with and then is there a order per se and he said not really but he did recommend a, a couple I um it, how would you was there an order of the books that you would read or well, is there a connection so to them? My first two books I wrote, Focus on the Good Stuff came out in 2007. Be Yourself, Everyone Else Has Already Taken came out in 2009. Those two books kind of go together, if you will. And they're, they're not old, but they're older, right? They're from a number of years ago. So I often recommend if people want to read a book about appreciation and authenticity, read those in those two, you know, Focus on the Good Stuff first, then Be Yourself, Everyone Else Has Already Taken. My two most recent books, Bring Your Whole Self to Work, which came out in 2018, and then We're All in This Together, which came out in 2020, those also sort of build on one another. Now you can definitely read them in either order. And it sounds like you may have read, we're all in this together first, but if someone comes to me and mm -hmm. says, Hey, I want to check them out and they're a leader or they have, they're part of a team. I'll say, start with bring your whole self to work and then read we're all in this together. Cause they kind of go together. My third book, which sort of sits in the middle, I took kind of five years okay. in between book two and three, and then book three and four is called nothing changes until you do. That one, I mean, you're not supposed to have favorites of all your books. That's probably my favorite book only because it sort of okay. stands right. alone in that it's a series of short essays. Okay. And I wrote it similar to my mentor was a guy named Richard Carlson who wrote the great series of books called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and it's all small stuff. And I wrote that book kind of that way. So it's 40 essays. It's a bunch of stories. It's very personal. Okay. But to me, it felt like at the time when I wrote it, it was kind of a greatest hits is a weird way to say it because I don't sing, but of all my favorite stories that I tell when I speak. So that one kind of stands alone. And I say to people, if they come to me and they're really struggling sure. personally, or they're wanting to work on their own self-esteem or self-acceptance or challenged in kind of personal ways, that book to me is my best in terms of personal growth and transformation. And then my most recent to okay. bring your whole self to work and we're all in this together are the best leadership and teamwork books. I think now, obviously I'm biased because I've written all of them, but that's kind of, yeah. you know, what no, I would say it. about my five books. And I think that, you know, I think what I see is I'm almost going to maybe just based on this and what I'm learning a little bit about your other books. It's a lot of the people I'm working with now need to read, read the, your first two and probably the third book first. Yeah. Um, ironically, where I am in my life, uh, you know, uh, I'm physically I'm starting to break down and I didn't take care of myself and not drinking enough water. And uh, a friend of mine said, you know, you, you, you spend your wealth to gain your health and then you spend your, yeah, no, you you spend your health to gain your wealth and then you spend your wealth to regain your health. It's true. And I'm beating myself up over it. So I'm, I'm going to buy your third, I'm going to buy the other book, uh, you know, yeah. and read that one. But, you know, people always think, oh, leaders, they have all their stuff together. And, and 
I, I think you, you need to be the best version of yourself before you can really fairly uh, and uh, authentically lead other people. Because if you're a mess and you're going to yeah. lead, that's, that's, that's the lack of authenticity. So it's uh, true. And I, and I would say this too. I mean, I know you agree with this. We were talking about this before you, we hit record and, and to the point you were just making, like, I think sometimes we think investing in ourselves and taking care of ourselves and doing the work on ourselves is selfish. Mm. Um, it's not. Yeah. Now, look, we can go about it in a selfish way, but doing those things is actually not only good for us, it's necessary for the people around us, right? I mean, all the cliches that put your own oxygen mask on first one that we use a lot is so true because at some level, if you and I aren't able to take care of ourselves, do our own work, keep growing, learning, evolving, changing, figuring things out, we're not going to be there for the people around us the way we need to be. And we're not modeling that which we want them to embody themselves. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes like the way we treat ourselves, the way we think about ourselves, the way we talk to ourselves, the way we care for ourselves has a lot to do with what we model for others. I remember years ago, I called my then girlfriend, now wife, Michelle, we've been together for 22 years. And I was really complaining about myself and oh, I did this, and I screwed this up and everything, right? And she said something to me, John, that was so simple, but beautiful. She said, stop talking about my boyfriend like that. And I said, wow. what? She said, you just said some really mean things about yourself. And I know you're frustrated and I appreciate <laughs> you being honest. She said, but if someone else were talking about you that way, I would be mad at them and I would defend you. She said, just because you're you, doesn't give you the right to do that. And I was like, first of all, I like this woman. Second yeah. of all, wow, like I never thought of it that way. Like each and every one of us, we are important people in other people's lives. So when we're mean to ourselves or we don't take care of ourselves, we're actually disrespecting the people who love us in addition to ourselves. And we're not then able to show up and be the best versions of ourselves, which we ultimately want to be. Now, this is not some holier than thou thing that like you can't have a cheeseburger and you can't drink a beer and you have to do everything perfect all the time. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm saying that at some level, we need to be able to realize that caring for ourselves as well as growing and changing and evolving and learning, that's foundational to everything that we want to do to all the people that matter to us, to all the goals and aspirations we have, not just personally, but collectively. So back to kind of something we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, it's balancing that great leaders don't just solely focus on their teams. Mm -hmm. They actually pay attention to themselves enough so they can show up for their teams because it has to be a healthy balance of both. Yeah. Well, I mean, that kind of answers the last question I usually ask is, you know, what's, what would you do? Like if you want to give somebody, Hey, I need to be a better version of myself to, you know, what's one thing as many that you would maybe suggest somebody do. Well, maybe. Uh, yeah. I would, I would say this. I mean, I'll get, I'll, I'll answer that question in an interesting way, just to tell a quick story. So a mentor of mine said something to me. So my wife and I have two daughters, Samantha's now 16, Rosie's 13. And when Michelle was pregnant with Samantha, we were about to have our first, right? And when you're about to have your first baby, everybody gives you a ton of advice. Most of it doesn't make sense because you've never had a baby before. So it's all kind of like, it sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher talking, wah, 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 like, you know, and people mean well. But, and I was, and it was towards the end of the pregnancy and I'd been getting a ton of advice. And again, I appreciated people good intention, but I was sort of like enough with all the advice. Like, I don't even really understand what you're talking about. But this mentor of mine, Chris said this thing to me. He said, Mike, the most important job you have when your daughter is born is to teach her how to love and care for herself. And I said, oh, well, that was different advice than anybody. I said, really? And it got my attention. I said, well, that's, how do I do that? And he said, you love and care for yourself and you let her see that. That's how you teach her how to love and care for herself. Now, as I was just talking about a few minutes ago, that is a challenge for most of us for a variety of reasons, even some noble reasons, like I don't want to be selfish and I want to be there for other people. But I think the thing that I would say, and what I do often say to people, what's the one thing that I can do to be the best version of myself? My response is love and care for yourself and do that authentically. And we actually live in a world where, and especially for us as men, but all of us in general, and women have a different version of this that's even more challenging in some ways, that doesn't actually get really encouraged or celebrated, right? but it's necessary. Yeah. Uh, yeah, wow. I mean, and I just think, you know, most recently my daughter, 
and my wife are this close to having an intervention, you know, not drinking water or whatever. And I have all the resources you can need and knowledge to get myself in shape. And I did an interview with Ben Bergeron. Uh, I don't know if you know him. Uh, and um, through the interview, I was chatting with him. I was a triathlete at one time and, and I, I got my knee replaced. And at the end of the interview, I said, yeah, I'm really looking forward to working out. He goes, well, what's holding you back? And I said, well, he goes, I'll tell you what's holding me. He goes, do you know how many times you mentioned your knee? No. I, was like, I was like, no. He goes, four. He goes, four different times during our conversation, you came up with the excuse that you could, you, even if you didn't have a leg, you could still work out. Right. And I was like, okay, coach. You know, I mean, if you're going to be coaching world champion and CrossFit guys, I mean, right. Uh, but it was one of those things where, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you have to take care of yourself. You, not, you have to, you, you deserve it too. And, and you, you owe other people that. Yeah. And it's an opportunity. I mean, again, yeah. I think for you, for anyone listening, look, we can go in when we have some awareness, I had someone say this to me years ago that I thought was really great. This, the four steps to change. He's like, the first step is recognize. The second step is acknowledge, like recognize what we're doing, acknowledge the impact. The third step, and this is the most important, is forgive. And the fourth step is change. So recognize, acknowledge, forgive. And then the change kind of happens naturally. He said, and then he was saying this to me. He said, Mike, what you do is recognize, acknowledge, punish, and repeat. <laughs> and when he said it, I laughed out loud and I went, oh my gosh, that's totally what I do. But I think sometimes what happens is we might recognize, oh, I have this thing. I'm not caring for my body the way I want to, or I'm not spending enough time with this person or focusing on that. Or as a leader, I'm not appreciating people enough or, oh, I should, whatever it is, all yeah. of us have these things, right? And then we acknowledge the impact. Oh, that's having an impact on me. It's having an impact on other people. We think if we punish ourselves, we beat ourselves up, somehow that's going to then move us in the direction of change. It doesn't, it just has us repeat the cycle and then more evidence to beat ourselves up. So the most important element of that is the forgiveness. And forgiveness doesn't mean we let ourselves off the hook. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we're not aware of the impact that it has. Forgiveness means we choose to let go of the resentment we have towards ourselves for doing the thing we've been doing or not doing the thing we know we need to do. And sometimes we may need some help. Hey, this is really hard for me. I've been struggling. I've been in this pattern for a long time, or I do have this sore knee, or I do have this challenge, or I do have this, whatever the heck it is. It's like, I need help with that. But I always say to myself when I'm struggling with something, I'll literally say this, I didn't invent this problem someone else has dealt with this problem and figured it out, like probably lots of people. So I got to go find people who can support me navigate through this problem. It is not unique and specific to me. Yeah. So again, I think you were in my head there for the last uh, couple of days. So, uh, you know, and it's just eating habits and drinking water, uh, you know, eating inflammatory foods. And I, I, I have it all, but I like that. Yeah. I acknowledge, forgive, no, uh, Re recognize, acknowledge, forgive and change as opposed to recognize, acknowledge, punish and repeat. No, I love that. Yeah. And it's, yeah. I mean, right there, if you, if you, uh, don't get anything out of that on this podcast then shame on you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, I will supply the, uh, the website, you know, your website, I know you're, uh, you do keynotes so people can yep. reach out and would they book a keynote through you or are you using a speaking agency? Mostly they come directly to us so they okay. can just go to our website, mike-robbins.com and then reach out to us. That's usually how we book most of our events. Now I have, you're on the West coast. We have a lot of large master franchisees in the business I'm in out there. And, uh, groups, you just have to work, uh, uh, work it out with them. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I try you Oh, I was gonna say, yeah, I travel, I travel right. around the country and around the world. So I do a lot of events in other places, but I am based here in, in the San Francisco Bay area. So we do a lot okay. of stuff here in the Bay area and on the West coast. Oh, uh, I'll be out there. Uh, actually, I'm going to get the opportunity to interview, uh, Dan Pedersen, who's the guy who started Top Gun. Oh, wow. Yeah, we have, uh, one of our franchisees father was a, a trainer with the Top Gun pilot. So he wrote a book and I'm going to go out to Palm Springs, I guess, in yep. the middle of September, I get to visit him and interview him that should be interesting i've met him once before but i got the opportunity to interview him which is pretty cool um you also have a podcast uh yourself correct i do yeah uh, and what is that and how would people find that one what Where, wherever you listen to podcasts or wherever you're listening to this just search for we're all in this together or mike robbins and that's the podcast oftentimes i do some interviews but oftentimes it's just me talking okay about different topics so Great. we've done almost 300 episodes so people can check those out if they want to 
and I will, uh, I have the library of books on display here at the training center. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, I buy books for certain people, but I'll let, let, definitely let people see that. And I'm going to let you, I'm going to get in touch with you when I read the other books. I'd love to even get an opportunity to maybe get on the phone, get on with you again and talk about Absolutely. one of the other books at some point. That would be pretty cool. So. Yeah. Anytime, uh, man. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks yeah, for no, having me and yeah. appreciate the work you're doing. Yeah, no problem. So I, I appreciate it. And you'll get to see, uh, you know, um, his contact information and the follow up emails and stuff. But uh, this is coach Hughes and, and uh, Mr. Robbins guys, check out this book, all the books actually. And uh, this is the be best you podcast. And we'll see you guys uh, next episode.